human nature not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut Ladies and gentlemen, we are now receiving the first image transmissions from the Nature Nut Mars probe. Launched from planet Earth on the day I was born in 1958, the probe has finally reached its far-flung destination. And upon the windswept landscapes of this distant world, the probe has discovered indisputable evidence that humanoid life forms do exist on the Red Planet. You know, I'm just kidding. We're not on Mars. We're in Saskatchewan. There are a few similarities, but it's hard to mistake one for the other. The similar parts are the sand dunes. There are sand dunes on Mars. There are sand dunes in Saskatchewan. There are sand dunes everywhere in the known universe where you get sand grains of a particular size being blown around by wind of a particular speed. It's just a little bit of physics. It's a universal thing, but only here on Earth do we find living creatures on the sand dunes? It's a very, very difficult place to make a living. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna go look for life on the sand dunes. But before we do that, I wanna finish explaining to you how the sand dunes got here in the first place. And that involves a little bit of what we call saltation. The sand dunes here, they're formed by the action of the prevailing wind. And in this part of the world, it's usually coming from back there, the wind comes just howling across the prairies. And then in this spot, when it comes over that little crest there, over the years, it's been swirling around and taking all the sand from where I'm standing right now, creating this great big bowl in the earth and dumping the sand over there to form a sand dune. But it doesn't just roll the sand grains along the ground. The wind doesn't just pick the sand up, carry it and dump it. It's well, it's picking the sand up and then it's bouncing it off other sand grains and that's why the sand grains are hopping. They're picked up and bounced. 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 And finally, the sand grain comes to the crest of the dune where the shallow slope of the pickup zone where the sand is being picked up by the wind changes to the steeper slope of the slip face, which is where the sand eventually comes to rest. Now, why do they call it the slip face? Well, they call it a slip face because it's real easy to slip on your face here. And you know, it's fun too. While the wind and the sand, they're working to keep these dunes just cruising across the prairies, plants like this, scurf pea, they're working to stabilize the dunes and stop them from moving altogether. It's kind of a dynamic thing here on the slip face. <laughs> oh. In Asia, there have been reports of singing sand dunes that hum when the wind blows. Well, you know, when it gets this hot, there's no point even looking for dune critters. So I'm just gonna hang out under my umbrella, pretend I'm at the beach. Oh, I've got a few things to show you though. Come on in or under the shade here with me and have a look at this. That little temperature probe is measuring the sand surface temperature, 121.9. That's pretty hot, it's not a record though. 135 was the highest we recorded here. Degrees Fahrenheit, that is, about 55 degrees Celsius. That's hot, that's stinking hot, that's smoking hot. Too hot for most dune critters. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting, even this far below the surface, it can be quite hot. 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we've measured but there's a lot of moisture down there if there's any rain at all, and there is rain, of course, here, or there wouldn't be so many plants here and there. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Let's dig a little test pit with our technical sand uh, displacement unit here. 
Hey, get off there, little skipper. I don't want to hurt the guy. Okay, on the surface, the sand is nice and dry and loose, but you get down not too far at all, and pretty soon it starts getting kind of moist looking. And look at that, I mean, isn't that incredible? That's moist sand. It's hot, moist sand, but it is genuine moist sand. Now, you know, the interesting thing about moisture in sand is that the sand doesn't hold on to moisture very well. So if plants can get their roots down into this moist level of sand, they can get the moisture out of the sand quite easily. And that's how plants like this scurf pea plant that's so common on the fringes of the dune around here, that's how they are able to do what they're able to do. Now, look at this. I mean, it's hot, it's midday, and the scurf pea are blooming. And they are attracting a tremendous number of nectar-feeding insects. There are lots and lots of digger wasps. There are bumblebees on the scurf pea. And the beautiful ruddy coppers. Ruddy copper is a beautiful butterfly, white underneath and, and orange on the upper surface of the wings. It's rather amazing that uh, here in what looks like the dustiest, driest, most inhospitable place on the planet, these plants can get enough water to uh, put on a banquet for the critters. They'll be visiting the flowers until it gets just so terribly hot that even that far above the surface of the sand, nobody can stand it. At that point, the flowers close up and the bugs go home. I wonder why I didn't go home. Eh, I'm just having too much of a good time. I'm gonna dig another pit. See where it goes. You know, these sand dune environments, they get so hot midday and midsummer, it's almost unbelievable. And of course, it has to do with the fact that there's just no place to hide from the sun here. And the sun is, of course, gonna warm you up. You ever think about why the sun warms you up? It's not the visible light, it's not the light you see that warms you up. It's the invisible rays of infrared light that are warming you up when you go out in the sunlight. You know what this is? It's a cheap camera filter. It's an infrared cutoff filter. And what that means, uh, it's $20, by the way, if you consider that a cheap filter. I want you to all go out and buy one of these because if you hold it up, you can't see through it at all. It's absolutely a black piece of plastic. It's not allowing any visible light through. It's only allowing the infrared to pass through that. Now, don't you wish you could look through this thing and see what the world looks like in the infrared? Mm, you can, and the way you do it is with a home video camera. Now, I'm gonna make myself a little bit of home movies here. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, vacation movie of the beach with no water. I'm gonna slip my filter on there, and here we go from the world of visible light right into the strange world of the infrared. I like the world of the infrared because it makes me look like I've got a better tan. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I don't know if all home vid video cameras are sensitive in the infrared, but this one works beautifully. Okay, let's go for a little stroll here. Oh, very science fiction-y. Okay, well, ignoring the orange cast here, or the greenish orange cast, notice the sand looks more or less normal. The sky is dark, the cold void of space, and the plants are very white, very reflective. They want to reflect away all that heat. Now, insects like this beetle, they're dark. That means that they are absorbing the heating rays of the infrared, and these little beetles are running across the hot sands looking for a place to get away from the oppressive heat of the infrared coming from the sun. Whoa, that's just incredibly gruesome, don't you think? This uh, little tiger beetle has captured a caterpillar on the open blowing sand. What she's doing is she's chewing it while spitting digestive juices on it and then drinking the caterpillar, just drinking the slurry and uh, chewing up the hard parts and spitting them out. We call this one the ghost tiger beetle. It looks like sand. It has a very sandy color to it. The color also prevents it from overheating. You can see that the wing covers are light color and the dark parts of the body are covered with little white flattened hairs. Those hairs push right up against the body and those white flattened hairs reflect heat away as well. So this is a, a tremendously well-suited uh, well critter to life on the sand. 
There's another one that's even more common around here, the sandy tiger beetle, Sicindula limbata nympha. That one is uh, almost as light colored, but not quite. But these two are very much creatures of the open sand, the open blowing sand. Once you get into the edges of the dunes, where there's a lot more plants, you th see things like the blowout tiger beetle, Sicindula lengi. He's a dark colored little guy who'd undoubtedly warm up and die from uh, overheating if he wasn't able to duck into the shade of a plant from time to time. That's a fascinating world. I love these things, but then I'm biased. Tiger beetles are, as I've said before, my favorite critters. Heh, <laughs> always chew your food at least 4,000 times before swallowing. Didn't your mother tell you that? The ghost tiger beetle is found all the way from Alberta to the American East Coast where it lives on seaside sand dunes. You know, the sand dunes are wonderful for animal tracks, especially early in the morning, because the animals have been active at night, the wind is calm during the night, and then early in the morning you can get out and you can see all these marvelous tracks with incredible detail in them. It's even better than looking for tracks on snow. And I was just trying to figure out this one. It has a drag mark down the middle. That's probably the tail. And then some little paw prints around the outside. And they have claw marks for digging. Pocket gopher? What do you figure? 13 lined ground squirrel? I don't know. Been seeing a lot of great tracks this morning. Deer tracks? But not just deer tracks, little tiny mouse tracks with beautiful detail in every little toe, whether those are deer mice or all of back pocket mice, and uh, kangaroo rat tracks hopping on two legs. And they're just, you know, they're all over the sand here. There's some places where they come together. They seem to have had a little conference of some sort. Then they go blazing away looking for seeds. Very difficult to read their stories, but that's half the fun, is trying to figure out what happened here. There was even a set of uh, three-toed bird tracks with not very much on the back toe, and those were probably sharp-tailed grouse. And probably the most interesting of all, although also the most difficult to interpret, are insect tracks, bug tracks, sometimes just the marks of little buggy feet, sometimes the feet and the drag mark of the abdomen, sometimes you see where they were digging and where they took off or jumped or something like that. Or, it's, uh, it's a wonderful subject, bug tracks. Anyway, it's a great thing to do while you're waiting for the dunes to warm up, waiting for the daytime critters to become active. You can go look at the tracks, and then, of course, as the sun warms the sand, the wind starts to blow. All these tracks will be cleared away in another hour or so, and it'll be a clean slate for tomorrow morning. Yeah, I saw something up here. Oh, there it is, 13 line ground squirrel. Ah, that's always nice to see them. You know, the last time we talked about 13 line ground squirrels on this show, I said they have eight solid stripes and eight broken stripes for a total of 13. And even though I've received hundreds of letters from you, dear viewers, nobody corrected my mathematics. <sighs> Just had to admit it, I was feeling guilty. 13 line ground squirrels, they love it here because they can burrow in the sand. There are a lot of rodents here in the sand dunes. Um, pocket gophers, the one I see quite often at night is the olive-backed pocket mouse. Little tiny thing that just goes zinging across the sand at night. Very neat. But all of those, they pale in comparison to the niftiest rodent of all on the sand dunes. This is the Ord's kangaroo rat, the most northerly of all the kangaroo rats in North America. They love to dig in the sand and they hop around on their back legs, which is how they got their name. For the most part, they eat seeds. They have a pretty rough time of it out here, especially surviving the winter, but this young male is enjoying a nice warm evening in late summer. Oh, there he grabbed a moth that came to our lights, but he's after seeds. Kangaroo rats look a lot like pet gerbils, but they are not very closely related.
hoping there was life here at all Right out on the sand the Wind blows the earth from the roots of the plants Sun warms the sand till it's too hot for ants Still life grabs a hold Right out on the sand Hoppers, beetles, and kangaroo rats They don't have sunscreen or big summer hats Some spend their lives in the cool underground Others lay low till the sun has gone down In the heat of the day The bravest of insects come out to play land for wherever there is sand there is nothing you can do about it it's a natural relationship between the wind and land life here at all right out on the sand wind blows the earth from the roots of the plants sun warms the sand till it's too hot for rents in the heat of the day the bravest of insects come out to play Okay, well, let's pretend for a minute that we're on a desert island. It's always kind of fun. Sand dunes are like islands in many, many ways. They are islands of sand in a sea of vegetation. In this case, the prairies. And if you were a sand dune critter, well, that vegetation might as well be the ocean itself because sand dune critters can't live in regular prairie. They've got to have sand. Here in the great sand hills of Saskatchewan, we have a unique subspecies of the beautiful tiger beetle. I'm talking about Sicindula formosa gibsoni, and that beetle is found here and nowhere else on Earth. It's a gorgeous thing, purplish with a lot of ivory on the wing covers. Very, very nifty. There's a, another unique tiger beetle in the coral pink sand dunes of Utah that is right now in the middle of a huge controversy between conservationists on the one hand who want to protect the tiger beetle and dune buggy riders on the other hand who want to ride around on the dunes. Uh, oh, they, they terrible tension down there. And we'll just hope that the beetle comes out okay and that the dune buggy guys are okay too. Here in the Great Sand Hills of Saskatchewan, we don't have that problem because the sand dunes are on private ranch land and the ranchers have no desire to uh, have dune buggies chewing up their dunes and making them any bigger than they are. So uh, as far as anybody can tell, the beautiful tiger beetle is safe here the way things are, which is nice. Who needs a controversy? The beautiful tiger beetle is the biggest in Canada and often eats the smaller tiger beetles on the dunes. All right, well, settle in there. We got your dune, sand dune forecast for the next 2,000 years, Western North America, and especially the province of Saskatchewan. The question on everyone's mind this weekend, are we gonna have...
Saskatchewan giving the Sahara Desert a run for its money, or is that rolling prairie just gonna roll on in here, roll right over top of those dunes? Well, let's have a look at our satellite map. Hello! Okay, well, there's one of my favorite dune fields. You're looking about 40, 50 years back, just after the Great Depression. You know, the dirty 30s, the drought, the... Oh, it was a terrible time, and there was sand blowing everywhere. Lots and lots of open sand. You can see it, it's easy, it's obvious, everybody can see it. Have a look at her now. Whoa, look at that. One little dune out in the middle. Little bit of dune down by the edge there. Whoa! You know what this is telling us? I know exactly what you're thinking. The dunes are disappearing. They're going away. We're going to be done with them pretty soon. The rolling prairie's rolling on in. Yeah, that's the truth, folks. She's going down. The dunes are disappearing. We got a 50% chance of fewer dunes in the next 2,000 years. Of course, the boys down at the Bureau, you know what they're telling us about? They're telling us about global warming. And that means... What does that mean? Hello, I know what it means. It means we're gonna have sand everywhere. It's gonna be just terrible. So stock up on your sunscreen, stock up on your little plastic shovels, and watch your blowouts, folks. <laughs> so what's a blowout? Well, this is a blowout. A blowout is something less than a sand dune, but it's still an area of open sand, usually by the roadside where someone is dug into the side of a hill with a tractor to get some sand or something like that. It's always worth stopping at a good blowout because you might find some sand dune critters. And you know, this is uh, serious stuff too to say that the dunes are shrinking. Most of our dunes are getting smaller these days. It's also serious to uh, think about the fact that if global warming is happening, it'll probably cause some droughts and we'll get more and more and more sand blowing around the prairies. Bad news for some people, but it's good news if you're a nature nut. That's the good thing about being a nature nut. You can always find something to be happy about. So I don't know, who knows if these things are gonna get grown over or not. If your life is getting grown over, perhaps a good blowout is in order for you too. See you again next time. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>